Welcome to this bite-sized, memorable look at the world around us. I'm Jim from Nature's Work. This window on nature is looking at the fascinating world of moss. So what will we be looking at? Well, what are mosses? How do they live? How can we identify them? And also what habitats can we find them in? Mosses are an ancient life form being formed before seed bearing plants such as pine trees and daisies came to exist. Their spore bearing plants and along with fungi, algae and fern are collectively called the lower plants. But they're only called lower plants of which fungi are an honorary member in the sense that they evolved first. So it may be better to call them early plants. Mosses belong to a, a larger group of plants called bryophytes, which include liverworts and hornworts. And in Britain, there are 1,045 known species of bryophyte, which are around 4% of the world's 25,000 species. Mosses evolved long before the development of a vascular transport system and therefore can't transport water to the leaves from the roots. But they do possess simple root-like rhizoids um, that function to anchor the plant to the substrate. As they have no transport system, they're able to absorb water from their entire surface and as such generally prefer damp and humid environments. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, the golden dune moss, which can be found around Britain's um, coastal sand dunes, is a true pioneer and is found on these really dry, inhospitable um, sandy environments. And in dry conditions, they look like this. They're shriveled up, they look the, uh, and appear dead. And yet a drop of water will transform them within seconds to a fully functioning photosynthesizing plant. So when you're next on the sand dune, Take some water if it's a hot, dry day and just see if you can uh, capture a time lapse of, of the transition. It's really fascinating. Some species can withstand several years of desiccation um, and even longer than that. Um, in 2014, a team from British Antarctic Survey and Reading University went to Antarctica and reported to have regrown a moss that had been frozen in Antarctica in the ice for more than 1500 years. And with the study, the researchers drilled core samples from the moss beds on Singi Island off the coast of Antarctica. The team warmed the samples in an incubator to normal growth temperature and light exposure. After a few weeks, even the mosses from the oldest samples began to sprout new shoots. So they are truly phenomenal organisms. So let's have a look at mosses. They have stems and leaves and can be from a few millimetres tall uh, to over 40 centimetres tall. The simple leaves are generally only a single cell thick, so you, they're translucent and you can almost look straight through them. They have a nerve or midrib in their leaf and some living on exposed rocky places often have like uh, a hair tip to their, to their, to their leaf which helps to reflect the sun's heat and helps with desiccation and the, the tolerance of, of drought. Some mosses are unbranched and others are branched. And then in terms of life forms, we get some which form tufts, some which form cushions, and some which form mats. There's a whole variety there. If we have a look at liverworts, they generally lack this thickened midrib uh, some have a body which is known as a thallus, where there's no differentiation between stem and leaves, whilst others have a leafy form. They're also less resistant to drying out and so restricted on the whole to damper places than mosses. In terms of their life cycle, mosses and liverworts release spores from elevated capsules. So there's a closer of the capsule, there's a developed mature capsule and on germination these spores develop into a sexual generation so this, the red spores there are, are produced and they produce this very small proteinema which develops into the sexual generation known as a gametophyte which produces both male and female sex organs and when mature 
sperm cells are produced that swim on a film of water towards the female organ. And then fertilization happens when the sperm reaches the enclosed egg cell. The fertilized egg grows and develops into the spore producing generation, which is known as a sporophyte. So the capsule enlarges and becomes this tall structure that you sometimes see on top of a, a moss, and that contains the little spores at the top. Most mosses and liverworts are also able to reproduce from small pieces or of shoot or even leaves. This is known as a non-sexual or asexual reproductive method. Specialized structures known as gemi form on the leaf tips or from specialized stalks, and they then detach from the parent plant to form a new individual. If we take a look at a couple of the more prominent mosses that you're likely to see out from walking in the mountains, one of them is star moss. And it's one of those eye-catching mosses you'll come across in the mountains and moorlands. And they produce these great big hummocks that you see in front of you, cushions of up to 40 centimetres tall. But when dry, they certainly don't look like that and the leaves roll in and they look dark and, and almost um, dead-like. But again, if you were to pour water over them, they would then come to life, so to speak. They also produce those tall box-like capsules, which we just described previously in the, the life cycle. So the, the scientific name of star moss is Polytricum commune. Commune comes from a community or a mound and Polytricum, Polytricum, it comes from many hairs and alludes to its common name, common hair cap moss. It's quite a cosmopolitan distribution found right across the world. It loves damp, acidic and base poor places. It can tolerate moderate shade some levels of pollution and nutrient enrichment. It's found on wet moors in the uplands, but also frequently in, low, in lowland Britain, in the west, and in wet woodlands, bogs, and ditches, and lake margins. Politicum do have the ability to draw water up through specialised tissues known to conduct water from the base of the plant around the outside of the stems. There are more than just the one species of star moss. Uh, we'll have a look at four that are very similar in appearance, but they're different species and slightly different appearance. Um, Polytricum for Mosum is very similar, but smaller, up to 20 centimeters tall, uh, prefers more shaded and drier habitats. Um, and it's also less shiny than uh, the Polytricum commune. Polytricum strictum, is found in tight hummocks on, on deep peat and cushions again can form up to 20 centimetres. Polytricum juniperum uh, is a pioneer on dry exposed acidic soil but only two to three centimetres tall. And Polytricum piliferum is very similar to juniperum but has long white uh, hair pointed uh, leaf tips. So again, subtle differences, habitat being important to distinguish where they're found as well as size. Sphagnums are a well-known group of mosses and they appear as these amazing multicolored living carpets found in wet places like peat bogs and marshlands. And bogs have this living surface which is created by this, these sphagnum mosses which float above dead and water-soaked older parts of the sphagnum plant, which may be um, up to several meters deep. And you can see in this image here, the, the lower sections are less green, so they're, they're the dead necrotic cells of the, of the plant. But they don't die away or rot because the ground is both wet and acidic. And so it preserves those, uh, those structures and it develops um, a peat soil, which is uh, a very organic, rich soil, but it's, it's undecomposed um, sphagnum plants, which, can, which are the predominant form uh, within that. Sphagnum mosses act rather like sponges and can stay wet long after the surrounding soil is dried out. And they can soak up 
and then really impressive 20 times their own weight in water. And the plants live just above the water table and you can see them raised up and therefore they, they get their nutrition and their, wa and their um, water from the rainfall rather than the underlying wet ground. There are many different types of sphagnum moss and they all grow at different rates. Some grow only a few millimetres per year, while others can grow up to three centimetres a year. There are 34 species of sphagnum in the UK, a third of which grow in bogs. And each species has its own specific set of requirements, its own niche in life. They all differ from the amount of water, humidity and nutrients and light that they require. And then when you bring into the equation competition for space and resources, then we get this beautiful mosaic of, of where we find these wonderful plants. So four different species here, uh, Capitifolium, Compactum, Palustra, and Subnitens. Woodlands are a fantastic place to, to, to investigate mosses. We have wonderful, rich assemblages uh, in these damp, humid woodlands. Uh, species can survive on tree trunks, uh, on these flat branches, uh, down by watercourses, on rocks. So it's a really wonderful place to go and ex explore. Um, species you might come across, fairly common in Britain, the greater fork moss felted thyme moss, narrow-leaved fringe moss, tree moss, which is a, a, a drought tolerant one, and fern moss, which has got this wonderful regular fern-like branching. If you're in the mountains, you may see them, especially in microhabitats where there's pockets of, of, of moisture or there's uh, damp shade under rocks and, and by waterfalls as well. On exposed areas, you might find the woolly hair moss. You might discover the red stemmed feather moss, the narrow leaved fringe moss. And one of my favorites is the apple fountain moss, which you find um, in wet flushes in the mountains. Please press like if you've enjoyed this presentation and feel free to write any comments and see you next time for more windows on nature.